let's go back into our study. And once again, we're going to pick up with Jonathan Edwards' work entitled The Experience That Counts. And let me just remind you, we've now looked at the contents of emotions, and he's done a great job of helping us understand the building blocks of uh, religious emotion. He then took us into the confusion that oftentimes will lead people to a false assurance or a lack of assurance because of emotions that neither prove nor disprove the validity of the faith. And now we're going to go into section three, which brings us to the truth that we will see in the signature and the fingerprints of the spirit in the Christian's life. So let me just tell you how Edwards opens up, and I think it's very wise. He shares three disclaimers at the beginning of this section. Again, part three, the distinguishing signs of true spiritual emotions. The opening remarks from Edwards include, I want to lay down the following guidelines, says Edwards. One, I am not going to help anybody to distinguish infallibly between true and false spiritual emotions in other people. God has not enabled us to make an infallible separation between the sheep and the goat. So number one, don't look at this as a litmus test for somebody else. Number two, I am not going to help Christians who have grown spiritually cold to obtain assurance of their faith. Listen, if you are lukewarm or cold, he says, don't look for me to give you some sense of assurance. It is not God's plan that such Christians should ever have that assurance. And third, coming into this section, no one should expect to find rules which will convict hypocrites diluted by imaginary revelations and false emotions who have become fixed in a false assurance. Says Edwards, such hypocrites are so sure of their own wisdom and so blinded by a subtle self-righteousness disguising itself as humility that they often seem to be beyond the reach of repentance. However, says Edwards, with those three disclaimers, these rules will be useful. What is to follow will be useful to convict real Christians who have mixed false emotions with true emotions. So let's take that and walk into the closing section here. The distinguishing signs of true spiritual emotions shared by Jonathan Edwards. One, true spiritual emotions arise from spiritual, supernatural, and divine influences on the heart. It all begins with the miracle of grace, the miracle gifted by God that is saving grace. Spiritual, then, says Edwards, means something that is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Scripture calls some qualities carnal or fleshly, even though they can exist in a man's spirit. So again, we, got to under, we have to understand the distinguishing marks here. For example, Paul describes pride, self-righteousness, and trusting in one's own wisdom as fleshly in Colossians 2.18, even though all of these qualities exist in a man's spirit. So again, you must understand the distinctions. Christians are spiritual because they are born of God's Spirit and because the Spirit, capital S, lives within them. Things are spiritual because of their relationship to the Holy Spirit, not because somebody calls them spiritual. God gives His Spirit to true Christians to live within them and to influence their hearts as a source of His life and action. Galatians 2.20 underscores this point and tells us that Christ, by His Spirit, not only is in them, but lives in them. And they live by His life. Scripture then calls Christians spiritual because God unites His Spirit to them in this way. Again, such an overused term, spiritual, spirituality. It's totally bogus the way it's used most of the time. Here is the right biblical understanding of spiritual. When the Spirit of God only acts upon the soul, but does not become a source of spiritual life within the soul, that soul has not become spiritual. Here again, I point you to Saul on the road to Damascus. He was truly impacted, but he was not yet converted. This is Edward's point. The Holy Spirit within Christians produces results which are in harmony with the Spirit's own true nature. 
Holiness is the nature of the Spirit of God. Therefore, Scripture calls him the Holy Spirit. That's why he is called the Holy Spirit. Holiness is the beauty and the sweetness of the divine nature and is the essence of the Holy Spirit. As heat is the nature of fire. Holiness is the nature of the Holy Spirit the same way that heat is the nature of fire. The Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of Christians as their fountain of life. It is only in true Christians that the Spirit works in this way. Jude 19 describes worldly-minded men, and he says, they don't have the Spirit of God in them. The effects which the Holy Spirit produces in true Christians are different from anything man can produce by their own natural powers. True spiritual emotions arise from supernatural influences. They are a miraculous work of God. We know false prophets had dreams and visions from false spirits. The Bible is filled with numerous examples. Balaam saw Christ in the vision, but he had no spiritual knowledge of Christ. So the idea that these things can't happen is just wrong. It's biblical ignorance. And so many wrong assurances are built on biblical ignorance. Emotions arising out of ideas in the imagination are not spiritual. Spiritual emotions can only arise from spiritual causes, says Edwards, those from the Holy Spirit that are given. The Holy Spirit gives us evidence that we are God's children by dwelling in us, leading us, and inclining us to behave towards God as children of the Father. It's not what we say, it's what he's doing in us. So the witness of the Holy Spirit is not some spiritual whisper or immediate revelation. It is the holy effect of God's Spirit in the hearts of his believers, leading them to love God, to hate sin, and to pursue holiness. It's not what I say I heard, it's what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. Terrible harm has resulted from thinking that the Holy Spirit's witness is a kind of inward voice, suggestion, or declaration from God to a man that he is loved, that he is forgiven, that he is elect, and so forth. How many lively but false emotions have arisen from this delusion? I fear, says Edwards, that multitudes have gone to hell deceived because of this. That is why I have dealt with it at such great length, says Edwards. Secondly, the object of spiritual emotion is the loveliness of spiritual things, not our self-interest. When it's all about me, it's no longer about him, and that is not of the Spirit of God. The primary object of spiritual emotions is the excellence and beauty of spiritual things, not the relation they have to our own self-interest. Love for God, which arises essentially out of love for self, cannot be spiritual in nature. Nothing can be spiritual if it is merely the result of self-love. The deepest cause of true love for God is the supreme loveliness of God's nature. Is he your treasure? The people whose love for God is based on God's usefulness to them are beginning at the wrong end of the equation. They are regarding God only from the viewpoint of their own self-interest. Men may love a God of their own imagination, says Edwards, when they have no love at all for the one true God. Oh, I love the God that I've manufactured, but I don't love the God of the Bible. For those that have wrongly interpreted these truths, they tend to have made for themselves a Mr. Potato Head God. And it's no wonder they would love him because he's more of a Santa Claus and a vending machine than the God of the Bible. Edwards goes on, he says, anything is lovely. Anything is lovely to a selfish person if it advances his or or her own self-interest. Well, of course you're going to love the God that you made because he serves you. Think of that quote. Anything is lovely to a selfish person if it advances his or her self-interest. True love begins, says Edwards, with God and loves God for his own sake. Self-love begins with self and loves God in the interest of self. These are eternal distinctions. I I, I cannot overemphasize this. These are eternal distinctions. And we know people, we have people, we have been around people. We live in a world that doesn't get this. Churches are chock full of people that don't get this eternal distinction. 
True gratitude to God for his blessing flows out of a love for God. And in spiritual gratitude, God's goodness touches people's hearts. So our love for God is something God puts in our hearts as a token of his love for us. The very demonstration and the reality that we could love him is a gift and a demonstration of his love for us. We love him because he graciously inclines our hearts to love him. So God's love for us produces in us a love for God. Spiritual delight in God arises chiefly from his beauty and his perfection, not from the blessings that he will give us. How different it is with false Christians. Edward says, in all the joys of false Christians, their eyes are on themselves. Their minds are occupied with their own experiences, not the glory of God or the beauty of Christ. They are great talkers about themselves. The true Christian, however, when he feels spiritually warm and lovely, loves to speak of God and of Christ and the glorious truths of the gospel. Third, spiritual emotions are based on the moral excellence of spiritual things. What a true Christian loves about spiritual things is their holiness. He or she loves God for the beauty of God's holiness. It is holiness that makes qualities lovely. It is the holiness factor that draws the Christian's love and heart towards the goodness of such a thing. Holiness is the beauty of all spiritual things. Scripture points to the beauty of holiness as the true object of spiritual appetites. Do you want what you can get or do you love the fact that it will draw you closer to Christ and that in these steps you are likely to become more holy, more like Christ? A spiritual person loves holy things for the same reason that an unspiritual person hates those things. And what an unspiritual person hates about holy things, he hates their holiness. That's what they hate about it. They hate the holiness that draws the distinction between the sin and the Savior. We can test our longings for heaven by this, says Edwards. Do we want to be there because of the holy beauty of God that shines there? Or is our desire for heaven based on our mere craving for selfish happiness? These are probing deep questions that really get to the dis differentiation between those that are pursuing God in the glorification of God and those that simply want to get from him. Spiritual emotions, number four, arise out of spiritual understanding. Spiritual emotions are not heat without light, says Edwards. They arise out of spiritual illumination. The true Christian feels because he sees and understands spiritual things. I want to emphasize, says Edwards, that there is a great difference between doctrinal knowledge and spiritual knowledge. Doctrinal knowledge involves the intellect alone, but spiritual knowledge is a sense of the heart by which we see the beauty of holiness in the Christian doctrines. Spiritual knowledge always involves the intellect and the heart together. It doesn't try to separate them out. We need to understand Scripture intellectually and taste the holy beauty of that meaning with our hearts. A person can have a great knowledge of doctrines intellectually in their head while they do not know spiritually these truths in their heart. It's a great word picture here that Edward Jews. He says, doctrinal knowledge is like a person who has looked at and touched honey. Spiritual knowledge is like a person who has felt the sweet taste of honey on their lips. He who has tasted knows much more about honey than a person who has only looked at it and touched it. What a great and powerful illustration that is. Spiritual understanding sees what is actually in Scripture and does not make a new meaning for it. Making a new meaning for Scripture is the equivalent of making a new Scripture. It is adding to God's Word, and that's a practice that God condemns. He says the true spiritual meaning of Scripture is the meaning it originally had when the Spirit first inspired it. This is so key and again leads to so many problems. When we simply let God speak for himself and we do the work of rightly understanding what he said, using the Holy Scriptures to interpret the Holy Scriptures so that we get it right, we will find that so much of the garbage that is used to distract and dilute and to take people away in deception would be exposed in the light of truth. 
Church leaders must be constantly on their guard, says Edwards, against these delusions, especially during times of revival. It's where and when things look like they're either going really bad or really good that this problem is most prevalent. And he says, you under shepherds, you better be diligent and on guard to hold up the light and the love of God's truth and to guard against those that would deceive others. In our emotions, if our emotions rise out of these imaginary ideas, these wrong interpretations, says Edwards, and not out of spiritual knowledge, then our emotions are spiritually worthless. He says, whatever comes up out of what is false is useless. And it doesn't matter how much confidence somebody has in it. It doesn't matter what surrounds it. Again, we've seen what the devil can do. So don't allow the environment or the circumstance that surrounds what is false to call into question the counterfeit. At its source must be God's truth and love and the power of his spirit. Keep this distinction in mind. Imaginary ideas can arise out of spiritual emotions, but spiritual emotions cannot arise out of imaginary ideas. Spiritual emotions can only arise out of spiritual knowledge. Spiritual emotions bring a conviction of the reality of divine things. Here again, one of God's telltale signs. The gospel becomes settled in indisputable in one's mind. You know that you know that you know that God's word is true. You know that the gospel is unshakable. He says, invisible things of the gospel influence this heart as powerful realities. You live by faith. You know it's true because God says so. God opens up his eyes to see these things. These things are undoubted realities. Consequently, such a person has a practical influence impacted on them by these truths of the gospel. Their heart and their behavior is shaped and impacted by the truth of the gospel simply because God says it so. Only when God's spirit enlightens our minds to understand these spiritual realities can we have a spiritual conviction of that truth. The fact alone, unimpacted by the spirit, will not generate faith. It is only when God, by his grace, charges that truth with his grace that the inspiration and the impact will come on the individual's heart. Unless we see the beauty of holiness, we'll be blind to the ugliness of sin. Hmm. A person can only see and feel the desperate depravity of his own heart if the Holy Spirit gives him the ability to taste the sweetness of holiness and the bitterness of sin. Again, the very awareness is a gift from God. We cannot obtain certainty from what scholars and historians will tell us. No amount of study outside of the Spirit will change the heart. Sixth, spiritual emotions always exist alongside spiritual humiliation. Edward says spiritual humiliation uh, by contrast, springs out of the true Christian sense of the beauty and the glory of God's holiness. Humility comes out of God's holiness. It makes him feel, the person, the Christian, how vile and contemptible he or she is in himself or herself because of their inherent sinfulness. This humility leads him to prostrate himself or herself freely and gladly at God's feet and to deny themselves and to renounce themselves in their sins. Spiritual humiliation is the essence of true religion. Those who lack it are not genuine Christians. Bold statement on behalf of one of the greatest theologians and minds that the Christian world has ever known. And yet, think about it. Bring these kinds of distinctive truths out on the street. Bring them into the contemporary cultural church. And the reality is most times you'll probably be called something between heretical and something worse. But these are the eternal distinctive truths that the world must know. And just because somebody has spent a lot of time in a church building does not remove them from the need to hear and embrace these truths. Spiritual humiliation is the essence of Christian self-denial, says Edwards. Proud hypocrites pretend to be humble. If someone else said about that hypocrite, what that hypocrite would say about themselves, oh, they would be so offended. This is one of the ways that you can know the false humility of the hypocrite. They will talk of themselves in one way, but let somebody else say the same thing about them that they said about themselves, and you watch how much in an uproar they would get. It's a keen observation. 
He says spiritual pride can be very subtle, oftentimes disguising itself as humility. A proud man compares himself to others, typically. Another sign of spiritual pride is that the proud man tends to think very highly of his humility, whereas the truly humble man thinks of himself oftentimes is unfortunately very proud. It seems like an irony, almost the makings of a joke, and yet it's such a sad truth. It was about three or four months ago I had somebody say to me that they had somebody that they were working with who had literally said to them that they were very proud of their humility. Again, you would think it came out of a joke book. Real life. Real life. Seventh, uh, or uh, Edward says before he leaves this section, he says, Dear reader, be careful lest you become proud of your own humility. Examine yourself. Seventh, spiritual emotions always exist alongside a change of nature. He said these emotions, they will be there where God does a supernatural change of the emotions. Spiritual sight has a transforming effect. You see this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. This transforming power comes only from God and from the Spirit himself. Scripture describes conversion in terms which imply or signify a change of the entire nature. For somebody to treat salvation or to claim that they have been radically captured by grace and only look as if or act as if there's been a little cleanup in the back alley behind the house is deception, pure and simple. If there is no real and lasting change in people who think they are converted, their religion is worthless, whatever their experiences may be, period. Jonathan Edwards. If there is no real and lasting change in people who think they are converted, their religion is worthless, whatever their experiences may be, end quote. The converted person becomes the enemy of sin. This is one of the ways that you'll know that genuine conversion has happened. A hatred for sin comes up and out of the person, first with their own sin, by the way, but then also all of sin. A person who says he has experienced conversion, but whose religious emotions soon die away, has his actions speak against him much louder than any religious experiences or claims may speak for him. Though God's grace does not destroy the failings of temperament, it can correct them, praise God. Conversion will have a powerful effect on those who have evil inclinations. God will not guarantee that you won't be tempted, but he will give you the power to be the victor in temptation. Amen. They will no longer be part of his true character, these wantings for the sinful way. In fact, sincere repentance will make a person particularly hate and fear the sins of which he used to be most guilty. Where that is not the case, there is great reason for concern. Eight, true spiritual emotions differ from false ones in promoting a Christ-like spirit of love, humility, peace, forgiveness, and compassion. All real disciples of Christ have this spirit in them. It is their true and proper character. There will be a genuine Christ-likeness in the new nature, in the new creation. Edwards goes on and he says, holiness and all its aspects belong to the true Christian character. True Christians will exhibit the same dove-like qualities of gentleness, peace, and love which characterize Jesus. The most outstanding Christians are also at the same time the greatest warriors. And they have a brave and intrepid spirit. It is our duty as Christians to be vigorous and resolute in opposing those who try to overthrow Christ's kingdom and the cause of the gospel. However, many people totally misunderstand the nature of this Christian boldness. It is not brutal fierceness. Christian boldness consists of two things. One, suppressing the evil emotions of the mind. And two, resolutely following and acting on the mind's good emotions without being hindered by sinful fear or the hostility of enemies. The courage and the resolution of the Christian soldier appears most gloriously when he maintains a holy calmness and humility and love against all the storms, injuries, strange behavior, and disturbing events of an evil and unreasonable world. This 
is a false boldness for Christ, which arises from pride. Talking now about where you get the overzealous, the, the Bible thumper, the person that is going to use religion to actually beat on somebody. Men will often oppose them oppose themselves. I'm sorry, men will often oppose those whom they call carnal simply to gain the admiration of their own party. True boldness for Christ, however, will rather offend all parties than offend Christ. In fact, boldness for Christ appears more clearly when a man is ready to lose the admiration of his own party than when he opposes enemies with his party behind him. The truly intrepid Christian is brave enough to confess a fault even to his enemies, if conscience requires. You see this again, we're shown, we're shown in Scripture that we are to be loving and to be just like Christ, to have the tenderness and the sweetness of Christ, and that we're to have the boldness in the warrior's heart. And those do not go against each other. They don't conflict. They don't contradict one another. They're designed in Christ's likeness to harmonize only through the power of his Spirit only in genuine Christ-likeness. Edward says, Scripture is quite clear about the absolute necessity of forgiveness, love, and mercy as qualities in the character of every Christian. Scripture is very plain that all true Christians having a loving, have a loving spirit. Love is the quality that Scripture insists on more than any other as a sign of genuine Christianity. Scripture is also clear that only those who have a merciful spirit are true Christians. Scripture knows nothing of true Christians who have a selfish, angry, quarrelsome spirit. No matter what a person's religious experiences may be, he has no right to think himself truly converted if his spirit is under the control of bitterness and spite. All real Christians are under the government of the lamb-like, dove-like spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nine, true spiritual emotions soften the heart and exist alongside a Christian tenderness of spirit. False emotions may seem to melt the heart for a time, but in the end, they harden it. Such people do not accept Christ as their Savior from sin. Instead, they trust in Him as their Savior of their sins. Oh, here again, the distinction Edwards brings is subtle in terms of the wording, but it is huge in terms of its impact. So many people don't want to be saved from their sins. They want to be saved in their sins. And that is not the offer. That is not the offer of the gospel. Edwards goes on and he says, These people think that Christ will allow them the quiet enjoyment of their sins and at the same time that he'll protect them from God's displeasure. I mean, think about how perverse such a thing is that God is going to come and kind of like be, be the watchman at the door to let you run crazy in your sin and not hold you accountable for it or treat it as if it's any big deal. Such it is when you see hyper grace or cheap grace extended. Well, it doesn't matter. I've got grace. God, Jesus died on the cross so that this doesn't matter. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. A true Christian resembles a little child. In spiritual things, the tallest and strongest saint is the smallest and tenderest child. Amen. True spiritual emotions, unlike false ones, have a beautiful symmetry and balance. True Christians never display grotesque lack of balance, which marks the religion of hypocrites. You'll never see this totally out of kilter. It's all law, no love. No, in the true Christian, Joy and comfort go along with godly sorrow in mourning for sin. See Matthew 5, 4. The joy of salvation and the godly sorrow for sin, they go together. They go together in true religion. On the other hand, many hypocrites, they'll rejoice without ever trembling. He says, see these as complementing one another. It is a both and. Where you find anybody coming at this from the either or standpoint they are wrong and it is dangerous hypocrites also display a grotesque lack of balance in their attitudes toward different persons and objects for instance says edwards some make a great show of their love for god but they are quarrelsome envious vindictive and slanderous towards their fellow men this is sheer hypocrisy 
a Christian's love must be universal. True Christian love extends both to the souls and to the bodies of our neighbors. Christ's compassion for the people's souls moved him to teach them, and his compassion for their bodies moved him to feed them. Again, it is a both and. A true Christian feels more concerned over his own sins, by the way, than the sins of other people. When you boil this down, we're back to the speck and the log in the eye kind of thing. You know, the true Christian realizes it's God's grace that keeps me going. And the reality is I've got plenty in need of forgiveness here in my own camp. I certainly don't need to be going out looking under other people's rocks. This is the heart of the humility of the true believer. True spiritual emotions produce a longing for deeper holiness, but false emotions rest satisfied in themselves. Here again, you'll find a want to, to go into a greater walk and a deeper worship of our Lord with a true believer. Edward says that the more a true Christian loves God, the more he desires to love him. And the more uneasy he is at his lack of unlove in himself. The more a true Christian hates sin, the more he desires to hate it. And he grieves that he still has so much sin in him. Someone may object saying, how is this ceaseless striving consistent with the satisfaction that spiritual enjoyment brings? Edward says, there's no inconsistency here. Spiritual enjoyment satisfies the soul in the following respects. First, there's a great desire which produces great anticipation. And secondly, if we are not as spiritually satisfied as we could be, then the fault lies with us. I say it differently. I tell people, you can have as much Jesus as you want. Somebody say, oh, I just, I just wish I knew God's will for my life. I, I just wish I had a closer walk. And the reality is, no, you don't. Because you can have all you want. It's like having somebody stand before a buffet and complain about starving. And so you, you have all that you want here, believer. You know, Edwards, again, he, he is so good at bringing us to the crux of the matter, bringing us down to where the rubber hits the road. He says that the true Christian is constantly seeking God. Scripture depicts the seeking and the striving of the Christian as occurring mainly after his conversion, by the way. You note this. This is part of the miracle. The miracle of God is he gives the want to to the heart that will now come with a worship and a walk that desires more of God. So we should look for this. And, you know, we talk about it at our house. We shouldn't act surprised when lost people act like lost people. If somebody's heart has not yet been changed, why should we expect them to be changed? What Edwards is pointing out is that want to and that walk, it should be demonstrated and it will be demonstrated where the conversion has been authenticated by the Spirit of God. He said, doubtless some hypocrites will say that they do constantly seek more of God and Christ in holiness, but a hypocrite does not really seek spiritual things for their own sake, says Edwards. The hypocrite wants better spiritual experiences, but for the sake of their selfish assurance. The hypocrite wants to feel God's love for himself rather than to have more love for God. I want to feel that God loves me more. I don't want to have to love God more. I want to feel better about me than to be a demonstration of faith for our Lord and others. The hypocrite knows that a real Christian is supposed to have certain desires. So Edward says, consequently, the hypocrite will imitate them. Again, I take you back to what I think is the most powerful quote in the book. Unfortunately, love can be imitated. Here, Edward says, the hypocrite knows that there are certain expectations to be seen in the life of the genuine believer. Consequently, they will imitate them. The best sign, says Edwards, to see in a true believer's life is a longing for a holier heart and a holier life where the real deal has taken account and the Holy Spirit has captured somebody by grace, there will be a real transformational want to, to live a holier life out of a holier heart. Twelve, the fruit of true spiritual emotions is Christian practice. Here again, talk is cheap. Uh, Edward says Christian practice means three things. 
A, the true Christian directs all aspects of his or her behavior through the Christian filter. We do it God's way. Two, the Christian makes holy living the main concern of their life. I want to be most like Christ. We don't ask, what can I get away with? What's acceptable? What everybody else is doing? Why? What's the big deal with that? The only pursuit is what is most God-honoring, what is most Christ-like for my life. And third, the true Christian will persevere to the end. It doesn't matter where you start or how you go along the way. It's going to only matter if you persevere to the end. This commitment to total obedience does not mean a mere negative avoidance of evil practices, says Edwards. It also means positively obeying God's commands. It's not that you just put down what you shouldn't pick up. It's that you pick up a love for the Lord and a walk in his way. This is true. He said the true Christian makes holy living the main business of their life. Christ's people not only do good works, they are zealous for good works. It's not enough to just clean up a little bit. It's having a desire to be the clean on Christ's behalf. All true Christians will fight the good fight. Amen. Edwards goes on and again, he presses beyond a lot of people's comfort zone. He says, lazy and negligent people are not running so as to obtain the, the prize that we're told to do as Christians. True Christians, they'll put on the whole armor of God. And laziness, says Edwards, in serving God, is as damning as open rebellion. Laziness is as damning as open rebellion. A lazy servant is a wicked servant and will be cast into outer darkness. Jesus tells the story. A real Christian is one who is diligent, earnest, and committed. A true Christian perseveres in his obedience to God throughout all of the difficulties. There's a no matter what factor in the faith, not based on somebody's strength, but on the Spirit's grace given. The true Christian perseveres no matter what, and Scripture emphasizes in the doctrine of perseverance that the genuine Christian keeps on believing and obeying despite the various problems that come into their lives. It's not going to be based on, well, it never got so hard that I lost faith. It'll be that the Spirit has given such true faith that nothing that comes will do anything but refine in that process. The sign of the genuine Christian is that he or she perseveres through these problems and difficulties and remains true to Christ. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2.10 Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Christ is not in the heart of the Christian as a dead savior. This, this is the key to understand in the midst of these trials and struggles. Understand that you don't have a dead savior in your heart. Edwards goes on, he says, Christ is not in the heart of the Christian as a dead Savior, but as a risen and living Savior in his own temple. People have a defective Christianity oftentimes because they are seeking their own interest and not God's. Again, we lose sight of this, the dynamic in this relationship. Consequently, those who are seeking their own interests instead of God's, they accept Christianity only to the extent that they think it serves their interests. A person's private interests may after a time clash with Christianity. So a person who accepts Christianity from selfish motives is liable to abandon it for their own selfish motives. They accept it for a time being because it works for them. But when that working for them becomes a cost from them, they will abandon because at the root and in the foundation is a selfish desire and not a spirit-given love. All you have to do is look to Demas. One of the best examples, you see one of Paul's co-laborers. And we're told towards the end of Paul's ministry in 2 Timothy 4, Demas has left me because he's developed a love for the world. Spiritual emotions result in Christian practice because they bring a conviction of the reality of divine things. If a person has never fully convinced, if they're never fully convinced that there is any reality in Christianity, he or she will not commit to a persevering obedience. You see, if all this is is kind of a neat thing that's working pretty well for today, but not into the foundation of the life, it will not last. Humility before God inspires obedience, just as pride inspires rebellion. Hmm. Men will not thoroughly change their practices unless they have a change of their nature. Edwards is saying, listen, when, when religion just cleans up our act a little bit, and it doesn't come from the Spirit, and it doesn't change from the inside out, 
it's not going to last. He says, until the tree is good, the fruit will not be good. Until and unless the tree is good, the fruit will not be good. If an unconverted person tries to live a Christian life, it is like throwing a stone upwards. Nature finally prevails and the stone comes down again. So it is with man-made religion, trying to push ourselves up to Christ's likeness. Without the power of the Spirit, we will come crashing down. The softened heart and tender spirit of the true Christian make him painfully sensitive to sin. Praise God. Creating a profound influence and impact on the way he or she lives their life. When you see a indifference to sin, that is speaking of a hardness of heart. Because as we see here, a softened heart will be tender to the reality of sin. It won't be, I don't have to. It will be, Lord, please, how, how, can, I, how can I give this to you? Please make me more like you as opposed to defending the turf and the territory that is sin or compromise. The Christian will not obey some of God's commands and ignore others. No, he or she is determined to be holy in every area of his or her life, in all circumstances and at all times. Here again, you look to the want to of the heart. Where somebody may want to hold up the legality of the action, you want to press in and look to the want to of the heart. But where somebody defends a right at the cost of pure or more holy righteousness, something is wrong. And the wrong is seated in the heart, not out in the actions. Christian practice is the most important of all the marks and signs of conversion, both to the believer and to others. Note this, it, it speaks so powerfully to the witness. He says both to the believer and to those who see the believer. It's the living out of these truths. It's Christian practice and behavior that is most important because this is the witness. This as a believer, either individually or collectively as the church, this is the calling card of Christ. And so if we live out a stain, it is the most damaging. And the degree that we can bring glory to God with the demonstration of our lives, it's the greatest thing that we can do by living out faithfully obedient lives. 13, two more. Christian practice is the chief sign to others of a convert's sincerity. Christian practice is the chief sign by which we are to judge the sincerity of professing Christians. Here again, scripture is very clear about this. It's the fruit. It's the fruit. Nowhere does Christ say, you will know the tree by its leaves and its flowers. No, a tree is known by its fruits. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Everything we say is worthless if it is not confirmed by what we do. That's Edwards referencing James 2.14. Edwards, again, his quote, words are cheap. It is by costly, self-denying Christian practice that we show the reality of our faith. It's the real deal. Along with Christian practice, there has to be an acceptance of the basic truths of the gospel. This is where you defend against the Phariseeism of legal doism. Christian practice is the best proof of the sincerity and salvation of those who say they believe, but it proves nothing about the salvation of those who deny these truths. No outward appearances are infallible signs of conversion. Christian practice is the best evidence we have that a professing Christian is a real Christian, yet we cannot see all the person's outward behavior. Much of it is hidden from the world, nor can we see or look into a person's heart and see what the motives are behind those actions. Consequently, we cannot be certain how far an unconverted person can go in an outward appearance of Christianity. There's no way of us knowing how far a lost soul who's determined to look like a saved saint will go. The distinction is in the eyes of God and God alone. 14, Christian practice is a sure sign of conversion to a person's own conscience. You will know in your conscience the truth, whether you admit it to anybody else or not. There will be a knowing down deep inside in the conscience. This is clear from 1 John 2, 3. God's word says, by this we know 
that we know him if we keep his commandments. It not only tells us the how, but it expresses the reality of knowing. When Christ says, by their fruits you will know them, this is in the first place a rule for judging others. But Christ also wants us to judge ourselves by this rule. As the next verse makes clear, listen to Matthew 6, 21. Here it is, God's word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, Christian practice certainly does not refer merely to outward bodily actions. The doing and the being is not just a bunch of robotic actions on the outside. It comes from the motivation and the love and the change from the inside. Christian practice refers more to the inward obedience of the soul than to the outward actions of the body. The Christian has to judge his own practice, not just by what he does outwardly with his body, but by the inward motives of the soul. This is where we have our come to Jesus time. This is when we get in that quiet place where we just ask the Lord to search our heart, reveal to us our motives. Lord, show me what I need to surrender to you to be in more Christ-likeness. It says, holy motives will produce an obedient lifestyle. So a person who lives an outwardly sinful life cannot make the excuse that his heart is in the right place. I know, I know that I'm living in sin, but down deep inside my heart is right. That's hogwash. Hogwash. Christian practice will include both the inward motives and the outward actions. Where it is inspired and empowered by God, it will have his signature. Our practical obedience perfects our love for God, and Christian practice perfects faith and love. This is a refining process. God gives it to us, and as we live it out, we are drawn closer and closer to him through the supernatural power of his spirit. We have lost our biblical balance if we major on feelings and experiences which do not express themselves in practical and faithful obedience. He said, if, if we talk about, well, you, you don't see it, but down deep inside, let me tell you, it's really God-honoring in here. I know you don't see it, Edward says, no, 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 don't, don't, don't even go down that road. He says, if we ignore God's clear emphasis on Christian practice and stress other things as tests of our sincerity, then we're on our way to delusion and hypocrisy. The evidence on which the judge will accept or reject us will be the way that we live, says Edwards. Christian practice is spiritual practice. It is the action of the soul and the body together. The soul moving and governing the body. This is the both and unified. True religion experience is where we love God and our love makes us choose him and obey him and stand by him in all difficult testing situations. He said the second objection some people may offer to him is they'll say that his emphasis on practice is legalism. He said this is nonsense. So I've not said that our practice is the price of God's favor. It is the sign of God's favor. Please get that. Because where and when you speak to the role and the necessity of faithful obedience, you will come under the attack of works. You you don't know grace. All these types of things. And that's just simply not true. I think that Edwards has said it so beautifully. He said that God's favor, it doesn't come at the price of our practice. No. No. He said, our living it out is a sign of God's favor. God accepts us as righteous because of Christ's obedience, not ours. We've got to get that right. We've got to get that right. Faith joins us to the Savior quite apart from any goodness or beauty that it may have from our perspective. Faith means simply receiving and accepting and resting on Jesus for the long-term health and stability of our souls. We're united to Christ by faith alone. It has nothing to do with what we do. To have a casual attitude toward good works because they do not justify us, he says, now again, look at it from the other side. Because if if knowing this truth, we now say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how I live or what I do. To have a casual attitude towards good works because they do not justify us is really no different from having ca- being casual about obedience being casual about holiness, being casual about spiritual mindedness, because really they don't justify us either. He said, don't let anybody deceive you into thinking these things. It's the both and. 
Holy practice, holy living is the sign of faith, just as activity and movement are the signs of life. Lastly, as Edwards closed his work, in his conclusion, he said, what a lot of trouble the church would have escaped if Christians had just kept to what scripture teaches about a true experience of salvation. I'll leave us there. I think those are profound words. I pray that this quick walk through the experience that counts, understanding the content of spiritual emotions, the confusion that surrounds them, and the spiritual validity, the grace-empowered truth that defines Christian and Christianity. I pray that Mr. Edwards' work and our time together will bless you.